Hello. Uh, so I'm going to talk about the, the middle of the testing pyramid. Uh, a little bit about myself first. Um, my name's Tom. All right. So uh, some disclaimers uh, first, the fun bit. So sorry, but I don't really have any cool tools or anything. There's no real cool demos here either. Um, it's nothing to do with burial sites. Um, I'm just talking about a testing strategy. I think it's quite valuable to talk about, so this is why I want to talk about it. Um, <clears throat> and I'm also just brushing the surface. Um, there's a lot to cover, so I'm going to go quite fast. So first, what pyramid? Um, you're probably quite familiar with this pyramid. If you're not, it's essentially just trying to give people some direction about how much tests to write and what type of tests to write. So the bigger the area of the pyramid, the more you do it. So you do the most unit and the least acceptance. This isn't just for front-end development. This is for all software, right? A lot of people are very familiar with this. OK, so now this is about React. So we're talking about front-end applications mostly, single-page applications. So just to sort of, um, I'm going to sort of scaffold out a little bit of a standard front-end architecture. So there's three boxes on the page, right? There's the big box at the top, which is I'm um, using to reference the bundle JS file, right? Um, and then there's the middle box, which is your browser, which sort of loads in the bundle. And then uh, the, the browser communicates, uh, sorry, the bundle communicates through the browser often to a server, right? Using these sort of APIs that you get from the server. Um, just another disclaimer, this is a little bit of a techie talk. I'm going to get fairly de deep into the techie stuff. So like you're using fetch, you're using XHR, whatever in the browser. Um, in your bundle.js, you've got your sort of entry file, which is where you start things up. And then it dives deep and gets an implementation. right? And then you've got your server to serve out requests. This is a sort of standard thing that most people do with single page applications. So where do unit tests fit in with this? Unit tests are great, right? No question about it. You give confidence of your code. You know, it's really useful um, for doing maintenance for doing improvements, <clears throat> fixing known bugs that you might have. Um, it's like a cheap proof. It's fast. You know, you can get a lot done quickly. Um, so here's the application again. Um, and where does unit testing fit in with this? I'd say it was around about here, right? I've got these th uh, solid lines at the top, um, which are sort of where you're grabbing your implementation and uh, you're asserting on bits of it. And then there's these dotted lines where you're sort of controlling things to be able to set up scenarios to test, like stubbing and spying and things like that. Um, and sometimes you even have dotted lines into your other parts of your implementation at times as well, right? You've got, you know, you, you're just digging really deep into there with your unit tests. And you might be using JS DOM instead of a browser. Just to sort of replicate that browser scenario, you might be doing that. You don't have to. It's just one way to go a little bit faster. Uh, there are some pitfalls for unit tests. They can be a little bit overkill. Like if you're doing a React component, if you've got your render method and there's a lot of markup in there, you don't necessarily want to test every single word in that markup. It's not, it can feel a little bit like overkill to do that sometimes. Sometimes it's just a little bit, you know, it's obvious. You can see what it is. You don't need to test it. Um, a lot of people tend to do something which I, is like you implement it first and you do TDD second, right? Um, so. I mean, it's this completely valid strategy. Sometimes when you're writing a test, you're like, I have no idea how this is actually going to work. So I need to experiment a little bit beforehand to figure out how it's going to work. And then I can maybe comment it all out and start writing tests to achieve that goal. And you might change things a little bit from the tests. But you know, it can be a little bit of a slow process. And you need to know about the implementation before you can do anything, sometimes. Um, also, with unit tests, you don't always cover those like micro integrations that you might have within your app. So, like your routing, not many people test a routing config. Um, you might, but you don't necessarily. This is something that gets sort of ignored or other configuration files. Um, if you've got a component that's like using Redux, for example, and you've got that connected bit at the top, you're not necessarily going to test the connected component. It can be quite overkill to do the tested component as well as the component itself. And it's just time consuming. It's a lot of files in your app. And if you're testing them all and you're changing them and you're sort of experimenting, it can be really time consuming to sort of go through them all and just get it all sorted. So you know, unit tests are great, but they're, also, they're not perfect. Another thing with unit tests is you can end up with something like this, right? Um, where you know, 
the windows, they're great, you know, you unit tested them. Uh, all, all the other pieces, you unit tested them, but you just didn't quite get it right. Oh no, it's upside down. <laughs> Damn. I don't know how far they would have got with this before they realized, and if it's actually real or legit or what, but shh, um, never mind. Uh, another, uh, these are the only two images of the talk, by the way. Um, this is another problem. These two doors work perfectly. Unit tested to perfection. But when you try and unit work with them together, that you're not quite, you know, it's not quite doing the job. So this is just to explain why unit tests aren't the sort of be all and end all of um, solving your problems. So another thing that people do to sort of get around this is they'll do browser tests, right? You just load the whole app. So browser tests are great as well. Um, they're a proof that the application works as a whole. Uh, you can even test the visuals. You can like take screenshots. You can make sure things are visible on the page. You know, um, they're implementation agnostic to some extent as well. You know, you don't have to go into the implementation. You just you're just looking at what's there on the page. You know, you're giving a location and just testing that this that it looks like you want. Um, so back to this diagram again. Unit tests are there. Uh, the browser tests. I'd say they fit in around about here, right? You're giving your browser a location, and you're asserting on what it looks like from there. And sometimes you might actually need to sort of control that server a little bit. You might need to do some test accounts to work with, or a test environment to um, control that server and create scenarios to um, to test. Um, so this is where I think a common testing pyramid comes in. This is. I've worked on a fair few projects in different companies, and this is a f not everywhere, but a lot of places do this sort of thing, where it's sort of, you've got your unit tests, and then you've got your UI and your integration tests sort of mushed together. They might be in different folders, but essentially they're all just these browser tests um, that might be in a different environment or something, right? And browser tests are not brilliant. They're not, they're, they're, there are problems to them as well. They can be quite flaky. Um, especially if you've got server farms and things like this. You get timeout errors on all sorts, and they're quite expensive to run. They use a lot of hardware or resources. Um, you can have like these mocked accounts or servers that you need to manage to be able to create the test scenarios. And sometimes these can get reset or something. They might not be in your control as a front-end app developer. Or you might be sharing them with different teams, and different teams can sort of affect the ones that you're doing, right? Um, also, people tend to use headless browsers to make uh, the, the cost a little bit lower, but um, they're not a perfect representation of browsers. They, there are some differences between headless browsers and normal browsers. And also, you have less power inside the tests. You don't necessarily get the full level of control that you might want to be able to create all the scenarios that you need, um, like you did in unit tests where you had full power, right? So. This is, where I'm, this is where I want to talk about, this is what I want to start getting, getting more of a vocabulary talked about, is a, how can we get a better middle layer, right? So this is what I think is happening a lot of the time, and I want to take it back to this, okay? With a, a different middle layer, a proper integration layer, so we don't have to do so many of the UI tests. So what would, what would be um, my idea? Like, what would be a, a good middle layer? What would we get from it? Ideally, it'd be cheap, you know? Get the cheapness of unit tests. Um, powerful as well. We'd want the power of unit tests as well. Um, but we want that value, that value that you get from the, 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 the browser tests. The browser tests, you know, where you're testing the whole thing and seeing it actually works. That's another, that's a win-win, right? Cheap, powerful, and valuable. So this is where React, I think, is really, really good. Um, we can use React here um, to do this integration layer. Take advantage of it. So what if we got our full app component and just use that to drive scenarios, like treating it like a browser in a way, but we don't need to go into the implementation and we don't need to use a browser. We can use that, that root of the tree that we often use um, and create testing scenarios from that. So here we get a small contract. We're free to refactor if we need to, which is good. Um, so it's implementation agnostic. It's fast, right? You just React is fast, you know, it it's ends up being a lot faster than a browser. You can go completely browserless and use JSON, super fast. Um, you can even stub out those boundaries. You don't actually have to make all of the, the requests to XHR or fetch or sockets or whatever you're doing. You can even stub out the cookies and whatever else. Pardon me. 
Um, so, back to this diagram. How do I, just to sort of get a visual representation of how I think this works. I'd say, um, like a sort of component integration test would be good around about here, right? We've got that same control over the browser uh, APIs that we had in the unit tests. Going down there, we control and fetch and push. But we're diving into the component tree, you know? We're not going deep into the implementation, and we're just having to skip that entry a little bit. Um, just to sort of be able to control it in a testing world. So how is it powerful? Well, you've got control over history push state. You can do your stubbing and your spying. You can do XHR and fetch and sockets, session, cookies, local storage. You can control all that. It's just like Node or your normal testing, unit testing world. How's the value? Um, well, you get to assert on the high level features like you did in a browser test. You know, you can assert on your DOM and your copy. Maybe you've got like, your branding's really important and you need to get the right tone of voice for your company. So that copy has got a lot of value or um, you may, maybe it's multi-language and you want to test that the full, a full journey works in the right multi-language scenario. Um, the transactions, you're not necessarily asserting on just the things that you get from the server that are displayed right. Sometimes you need to assert that the things that you send back are correct as well, right? What about your data tracking and your analytics? You know, you, can get, you get the ability to test that here. <clears throat> um, you get the coverage of the integrations that are missed by unit tests. So like the routing, you wouldn't necessarily do it in unit tests. You can cover it in detail here. And those, uh, those connected components, you can cover those as well. And you can even just go on full customer journeys. You can just drive a, a complete scenario through these tests and make sure it's all covered. And you can do loads of them. Um, maybe not as many as you would do unit tests, and, but definitely more than you would do browser tests. So uh, some basic code examples. These are a little bit pseudo codey, a little bit uh, contrived, but um, I'll just go for them. So this is a complete one, straight up. So at the top, we're, I'm using Enzyme here. I don't know if you're familiar with it, but it's a, a sort of assertion library for React, and it's really, really useful for this. And then um, app main is uh, my application. That's where my root component lives. I'm also getting history, and I'll explain why in a minute. So with history, this is your like window.history um, push state, right? This is something that our, this app works by. And I'm pushing to the path bar, okay? But um, I've had to get that history um, not using the window push state one, and that's because of JS DOM. JS, I'm using JS DOM for this, and it just doesn't have a complete window implementation. Um, so what does that history look like? I'm using this library, um, create memory uh, history, uh, made by the React router people. Um, and they do a memory history, and that's perfect for this scenario. As long as my app's using that history, then I can still use it to drive my tests. So a little bit of a compromise, but you know, it's still valuable. Um, so yeah, there we go, that was the history. And now I'm doing a full mount of my app, right? So you might be familiar with Enzyme. It's got shallow, mount, and render. Um, render, that's just gonna give you HTML. Shallow, that's only gonna go one component deep. We want a full mount, we want the whole thing, right? It's still fast, you know? Shallow's often the thing that people go to first, but in these scenarios, I think mount's really good. And then we can just start asserting, right? We can use the, make sure that the document's updated. So here I'm testing the titles, the right for my bar page that I've loaded. Um, and what I'm doing is I'm using um, selectors. Like, so I've got a selector for dot bar root, and I've tested, like, maybe use snapshots or something in the component itself to make sure the markup's right there. And now here, I'm just making sure that that's the thing that's present on the page in this scenario. And then the title here, I've got a copy test. This, this copy is vital for this app, right? Welcome to bar. And I need, I need to test it here. Okay. Um, now I have main there. So what is main? So essentially, this is main. I'm using React router and Redux in this application, but you don't have to. Um, so I've wrapped my main, I've got a provider with a store and the connected route and then my app. It's all those things. There is the React render at the bottom, um, but we don't want that, right? We're just going for, we're going for the main. That line at the bottom, that React render, we're going to do that inside our tests. <clears throat> so another example, how about stubbing server responses? Okay, a little bit more meaty. So this is the full thing. Um, in this, I'm using a library called fetchmark because my app's using window.fetch. So what fetchmark does is I say, okay, as soon as my app makes a request to, uh, a get request to API uh, bar, I'm gonna control what it responds, okay? So I can create that scenario in my test, done. Um, here I'm saying a 200, I've given it a body with some bar response, some headers, 
and then same as the other test, load up the bar page, mount the app. That's going to kick off loads of stuff behind the scenes. When the page loads, it's going to make some request. Um, and then I just want to make sure that my, uh, my API bar has returned this response up at the top. And for each one of those, I'll make sure it's display, uh, displayed on the page, OK? In the correct order as well. Um, simple as. So one thing that we can't do in browser tests sometimes is stubbing server errors. Um, you can, but sometimes you don't have control of that, um, that server that you need in the browser test scenario. And maybe the team that does, they don't like to give you a 500, right? They, they just don't want, to, they don't want to support 500s. It's not something that people want. But we want to cover that that, that app handles it, yeah? Simple as that. Done. I can make sure that my app handles correctly a 500. Um, the whole app, not just the, the service. Um, how about testing authentication logic? Pretty simple, right? My authentication logic here is driven through a cookie called auth token. I've just expired it. I push to the private page. And then um, I make sure that it's redirected to the login page, and I've got my login form. Done. Um, so obviously, this isn't a silver bullet, right? There are pitfalls. So like I said, JS DOM is incomplete, unfortunately. Um, like the window. Um, location doesn't quite work fully. Um, that's why I've had to use a memory location for that. And you can, you can end up like writing a few little implementations and adding them yourself if you need to. Like um, if you need to have better support for session, for example, you can just make your own little uh, stub for that. That's fine. Um, you might end up duplicating tests a little bit as well. You know, it's up to you where you go with this, if you use it at all as well. Um, but you might end up find that you've got a little bit of overlap between your browser test and your unit test and where this covers as well. I think that's a good thing, you know. Um, it doesn't end up costing that much in time, but, you know, it, it gives you more confidence. But you still need those unit and high-level tests. I'd still say you're doing them both. Um, you're not really asserting on the visuals either, so you're not actually seeing what it looks like. You're not taking screenshots or anything like that. So you still need the browser test for that if you want to do that sort of thing. Um, you're not asserting on browser quirks either, like maybe uh, Safari does something a little bit strange. Pardon me, it's up to you where you cover on this. Um, and you're not even fully testing the markup. You're trying to cover that in a unit test as well. It's just about finding that balance and um, making sure that the, the, the overall features there and the business logic's covered. And also, I don't really know a name for the approach. I keep on calling it different things, you may have noticed. Um, but yeah, there's a, there's a few names, and people might disagree with me on various things. Um, so some other gotchas as well, um, just because we've done it a lot at Sky, and um, we've noticed a few little quirks and things. So one is clean up between tests. If you don't do it, it can come and bite you a little bit. Um, but as soon as you're familiar with how you clean it up, it's fine. You can just get on with it. Um, so you might have a little bit of leak of state from one mount to the next. Um, so say you did one mount and then you've got it reacting to location changes or something. Uh, you might end up having two apps if you don't clean up. But it's the same with unit tests, right? You need to clean up. Um, it can also be tempting to increase that contract. So at the moment, I have main as my contract, right? That's the thing that I'm using render with. And I also increased it a little bit to use that history. Um, which was my compromise that I had to make. It can be tempting to sort of reach in and grab that service that you're using and stub the response or something. But I'd say don't do that because then you're going to get more freedom to refactor and still keep value of these tests without having to change them. Um, they are a bit slower than unit tests as well. Not much, but just a little bit. Um, and they can be a little bit tricky to organize. With unit tests, it's like you duplicate the file name and you put spec at the end, right? It's easy. But with these things, you tend to have to sort of come up with a strategy depending on what your business logic is and how your app's structured and what's important to you. Um, and also with that, um, JavaScript does have a single queue. So uh, that can cause a little bit of pain for organizing as well, just because sometimes when you've mounted your app, you need things to play out in the background before everything's updated and settled down before it's worth asserting. So just throwing in a little set immediate here or there can, um, can really help with that. Um, so a demo. Um, I'm just going to like run some tests. So this is a project that we're working on. I'm not going to show you any code. Um, but first, I'm just going to run um, the unit tests for the app. So you get an idea of the unit tests running. Um, give it a moment. It might take a while to sort of have a think. 
Um, so these are the unit tests for the application, right? So the unit tests are still good for us. I don't know if you can see down there, but we've got like um, uh, 1,400 of those running in two seconds. Not too bad, you know, but this is, um, now I'm gonna run our sort of middle layer instead. So that was the bottom layer, the, the main beef, um, and now I'm gonna run our integration tests. Um, and as you can see, they're quite a bit slower. But you have to bear in mind that every single one of those white lines on the page, every single one of those white, I'm mounting the whole application, right? And each one of these is a, an important business scenario for us. They're all, they're all, they all have a lot of value. And they actually, in my opinion, they catch a lot more than unit tests do um, without having to change them much as well. And you can see I had uh, 260 of those, right? And each one of those could have been a browser test quite easily. And if you can imagine running 260 browser tests, it can end up eating a lot of time. So, and that was only 23 seconds. So my feedback loop for developing these, you know, that was, it's actually really powerful and useful. Um, end of the demo. All right. Um, so some other ideas just before I finish. Um, you can do the same approach, but for individual routes, some people already do this. You know, you just you grab your connected component and mount it and see if it works. That's perfectly fine. I'm just saying, maybe if you just took a step back and did it on your whole app, you might be able to keep reusing that and get a lot more out of it. Um, you can just unit test your routes and your configuration if you want. That still covers some of the problems, you know, solves some problems. Bit tedious, and you might end up just copying and pasting a lot of stuff and having the same error in both places, in the unit test as well as the app. Um, you could just write more browser tests. You know, that's perfectly fine as well. That's what a lot of places do. Um, I find them a little bit flaky, personally. Um, one thing that we use um, is we've actually synchronized our app with the session store on the, on the DOM. Um, so what happens is we can set up a scenario in our test in the session and then when our app loads up it jumps straight to that position in our app and we can start using that to test from um, you can do the same with like local storage as well if you want or index db or whatever um, but this is we found a lot of value in this in a way to, to be able to help us um, skip long journeys in our tests and be able to organize the tests a little bit better um, also, you don't have to, I know this is React, but you don't have to use React and Enzyme. I've done exactly the same approach with uh, a shared library, but um, it needed to be used for React because it needed to be small. Um, and we use Cheerio for that. And if you don't know Cheerio, it's basically like jQuery for JS DOM. You just create like a jQuery wrapper and you can start selecting things and doing all the jQuery stuff with JS DOM. And, that, and it works perfectly, it's just the same. And that's it. Questions? Easy questions, please. I need a beer. Um, so, looking at the demo, that was a really good demo, and I noticed in you were stubbing down right down to the fetch layer. Um, yeah. Would it would it make any sense at all just to say stub at the say Redux layer, so like actually stubbing your entire state object? So in some scenarios you might have a lot of HTTP requests for a single route at the same time. Um, would it make sense in that scenario to maybe stub it at the Redux state layer, or is there not much point to it? I mean, yeah, you can definitely do that, but I find that um, that this like this endpoint bar. This is some, sometimes coming from the business, right? Whereas the state, that's something that I'm controlling, and that's gonna change potentially more easily than this, okay? So to me, this is like a, has a higher business value. That's why I um, stub at the fetch layer in the actual request instead of the implementation. But like I said, we use the session store to, um, which basically sort of creates a sort of fake state, and our app synchronizes with that. And then we get the same benefit that you're talking about. Yeah. Cheers. Right. Hello. Um, yeah, so I presume you still have browser tests as well. Would you say this replaces some of the browser tests, or is this an extra layer? Or this, so originally, in our team, before we had these, we had maybe... Um, 
40 browser tests, and we found them really, really painful. It took like 45 minutes to run them, so, and then to find out that one had broke, you'd had to wait the 45 minutes before you could develop it. So then we started doing this. We slimmed those browser tests down to two minutes initially and had these down at 26 seconds. So it saved loads of time. But definitely the browser tests are invaluable, right? There can still be problems that these won't catch that the browser tests will, um, but it just means that you, you, you're obeying that pyramid more accurately. You know, we've, we're taking advantage of the middle layer and we're doing far less browser tests instead of the, um, the, the, the two-layered pyramid that I um, showed before. Instead of this, yeah. Thanks for the presentation. So on this slide, we have UI and integration and unit tests at the bottom. But from the code you, you've shown, it seems like the, um, yeah, we get this. But actually the integration layer, it seems like they're very sort of glorified unit tests because there is a lot of uh, mocking involved. So based on that, could this, uh, could this look like unit test and integration together and then the UI at the top? Um. I would say we're taking the best of both because with unit tests you're going into the implementation. It's um, oh yeah, exactly. Th that's why maybe they have to. They seem like it's better for them to be like together. Like you have unit and integration because they are very closely related because of the mocking involved. Um, the thing is, the mocking that we do is generally just we're just mocking this stuff in the um, in in the uh, the middle layer. Whereas in the unit test, we can end up mocking some of this stuff as well. So that to me, that to me is a really big difference. Um, that's why I think it's, it's like that. I mean, if you've ever done um, Node stuff, Supertest is a really, uh, uh, like the equivalent in Node. I don't know if you're familiar with Supertest, it's but it's like you run the whole app, you make a request, and you see that it does the right thing. You can end up mocking out other servers that it communicates with, but we have Supertest tests that sit alongside our um, app tests as well. So, I mean, yeah, there's definitely a lot of similarities between these tests and unit tests, but for me, that's just, there's a lot of power and um, cheapness to unit tests, so it's just taking advantage of that. Okay. And um, what sort of architecture do you use for uh, these unit tests? So, like, as you said, specs are sitting alongside the file, whereas for integration tests, it's a bit more difficult. So, do you have an example of how you structure? Um, we, we um, I don't really have an example without show you, showing you NDA code, so I can't show you, sorry. But um, we, we tend to organize a lot by routes, so like paths of the page. We put a folder for that because a lot of logic happens in those. But then if there's an important widget on the page that uses a lot of components behind the scenes and a lot of services, we might have a file or a folder specifically for that, just so we can really drill down into all of the scenarios that that has to deal with. Um, and it's, I think it just sort of grows over time. You start experimenting and then it's not too hard to sort of move them around a little bit just as you start to evolve and learn about um, the direction that your app and your business wants to go in, right? So I, I don't know if that answers your question that much. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, okay. Any more questions? Oh yeah, I think it's good to take the last one, thanks. So I had like continue to answer the question about like combining unit tests and integration layer. So you said you are mocking fetch, you are using like cookies history, and that's probably it for integration tests. Do you really need JS DOM in that case? Like couldn't you basically treat entire app as a single component that you are unit testing but on the high level and basically just traverse virtual DOM for your class name is cl class names and so on? Like just not use DOM at all um, on that level? Um, we, we, we maybe could, but I think the DOM helps with doing a full mount because we want to react to click events that happen, so sometimes we actually fire a click. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, I've got, just one second, oh my, I've got a, um, uh, I've got a file that I can open. Uh, I think it's called example test. Uh, so this is an example test that we have. Um, I don't know if it's got any clicks on it, but you can see that we do test more than just browser fetch like here, we're making sure that the, um, the, the tagging is correct. Like yeah, sure, but I mean, like, for, for selectors, what I meant, you, you can just basically use them against the virtual DOM instead of the real DOM, right? So, so right, you, could, you could just the, render it virtual DOM when it's not mounted to the real one, and then you don't need JS DOM and you could run your test faster, maybe? Um, 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you want to talk to me more about that after, I'm interested. Um, for me, like JS DOM is quite fast. As you saw, it was only 26 seconds. But if we can make it even faster, then yeah, I'm all for it. OK, yeah, thanks. Let's give a big warm, warm hand, round of applause for Tom.